All right, we're ready. Yes. All right, good morning, and thank you for joining today's event, Engaging the Artemis Generation, a virtual event with NASA astronaut and Camus native, Dr. Michael Barrett, hosted by Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler and NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstein. I would like to remind participants that this event is being recorded and all participants will be muted for the duration of the event. Now I will turn it over to one of our hosts, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Well, thank you, Damara, and it's great to great to be with all of our participants today. You know, Jamie Herrera Butler and I served together in the House of Representatives, and uh, I'll tell you, she does an amazing job representing her constituents there in Washington. Uh, really, in a in a very bipartisan way that um, that hopefully uh, people can see that in NASA too that what we do is important for the nation and in fact important for the world and that we're working every day to do some some amazing things some stunning discoveries and then ultimately uh, use all of what we learn to to improve life here on Earth. Uh, we also have with us today Mike Barrett, who is of course. Uh, a NASA astronaut uh, and somebody who has done now two missions uh, to, to the International Space Station. He's also a medical doctor, of course, uh, from Camas, Washington, a uh, graduate of the University of Washington in zoology, you know, which is uh, important. Um, but it's uh, it's great to be with you all. I'll say a few words and then I'll turn it over to uh, Congresswoman Jamie Herrera Butler. So. Right now, NASA has a big agenda. We we have been in low Earth orbit, orbiting the planet now here for almost 20 years with the International Space Station. That represents 20 years of American astronauts and Russian cosmonauts and a lot of our international partners living and working together in space, creating these really stunning achievements that are, are to benefit humanity here on Earth. The next big step is to go back to the moon. Just like we've been sustainable in low Earth orbit, we want to go to the moon to stay, which is very different than what we've done in history with the Apollo program, for example. We love the Apollo program. We love Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin and that first moon landing. And we love the five missions to the surface of the moon that came after that. The problem is that program ended. This time when we go to the moon, we want to go sustainably to the moon. We want to stay at the moon. We want to go to the moon with international partners, which did not exist in the 1960s and early 1970s. We didn't go with international partners. We want to go to the moon with commercial partners, with an open architecture so that private companies can capitalize and go to the moon and do their own activities using the hardware. In fact, using a lot of the architecture and the uh, the infrastructure that NASA builds to enable all of these capabilities on the moon so that we can sustain. We're going to the moon this time to stay. But we're also going to use the resources of the moon to live and work for long periods of time. There's hundreds of millions of tons of water ice on the south pole of the moon. Water ice represents air to breathe. It's H2O. The oxygen is, is necessary. Uh, to breathe. Uh, H2O, water, is necessary to drink, and hydrogen is energy. Uh, it's the same, in fact, rocket fuel that powered the space shuttles. It's the same rocket fuel that will power the space launch system, the most powerful rocket ever built that will be taking our astronauts to the moon by 2024. So this is an amazing time. Uh, we're going to take all of this knowledge and then we're going to go to Mars with that knowledge. People say, well, why do you want to go to, to, to Mars? The reason you go to Mars is because there's so much to be discovered there. In the last few years, we have found that there are complex organic compounds all over the surface of Mars. What does that mean? The building blocks for life exist on Mars. They don't exist on the moon, but they're all over Mars. We, th we think about the fact that the methane cycles, methane being one of those organic compounds, the methane cycles of Mars match the seasons of Mars. That doesn't guarantee that there's life there, but the probability of finding life just went up. 
We have also discovered what we believe to be liquid water, 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. What do we know about liquid water on Earth? Wherever it exists, there's life. Is that true on Mars? We don't know, but we need to go find out. So there's a lot of really exciting reasons to go to Mars from science and exploration and discovery. But in order to get there, we need to learn how to live and work on another world for long periods of time. And that's what the moon is really all about. The value of the moon is it's with Earth. Wherever we go around the sun, the moon is with us. Mars and Earth, we are in very different orbits around the sun, and we are only aligned on the same side of the sun once every 26 months. So when we send our first astronauts to Mars, they have to be willing to stay for a long time because they might not be able to come back for a couple of years. Although if we advance some of the technologies that we're working on today, uh, that we can change that. For example, nuclear thermal propulsion or even nuclear electric propulsion could be an absolute game changer for how we traverse the solar system. So there's so many exciting things happening right now, but I want all the young people out there to know this. This time when we go to the moon to stay, we are going with all of America. When we think about the Apollo program, the Apollo program in that era, all of our astronauts came from fighter pilot backgrounds and test pilot backgrounds, and there were no opportunities really in those days for women. Well, now we have this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps, not just, not just diverse in, in terms of ethnicity, but diverse in terms of background. Today, we're going to hear from Mike Barrett, who himself, I mean, he's a medical doctor, studied zoology, undergraduate at, at the University of Washington. So we're, we're really looking at, at um, how do we get the most out of our exploration and discovery in space. And so that means we're going to need a very diverse group of people to go. And because we're looking for that diversity, we have um, at NASA, um, you know, not just this very diverse, highly qualified astronaut corps, but we actually named the program after the twin sister of Apollo. In Greek mythology, Apollo had a twin sister. Her name was Artemis, and she was the goddess of the moon. So here we are, 50 years after Apollo, we're going back to the moon sustainably with commercial partners, international partners. We're going to use the resources of the moon to live and work for long periods of time so that ultimately we can know how we're going to survive on Mars for long periods of time. And we're doing it under the name of Apollo's twin sister. Her name is Artemis. So there's so much exciting things in front of so many exciting things in front of us. Um, and I'm very excited to, to, to hear from the students today and have them interact with, with Mike Barrett, who's, you know, one of our, our astronauts that has done and will continue to do amazing work on behalf of the United States and humanity in general. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll turn it over to a friend of mine, um, Representative Jamie Herrera Butler, who has, you know, done amazing work on behalf of the United States of America, represents her constituents so very well and does it in a, in, a, in, a, in a bipartisan way that enables, it really enables our country to move forward on big agendas like the Artemis program. So uh, Congresswoman Butler, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much. It is such a pleasure to be here. And I, so I, I have someone who's very excited, had a lot of questions. I'm hoping that she learns today um, <laughs> so, uh, from, from all the answers. We're so excited to hear this, is, this program is something that I think captures all of our imagination, whether we're older or uh, younger, um, it, it's a big deal. Yeah, it's really for the youngsters, so sit down, please. So thank you, Jim. Uh, Administrator uh, Brian Stein, it is such a, a privilege to get to have you. Thank you for being willing to help kind of host this entire thing and bring it to Southwest Washington. I am excited to say we have our very own Southwest uh, Washingtonian uh, NASA astronaut. And, and not everywhere gets to claim um, an actual astronaut. So we are so excited to have Dr. Michael Barrett joining us today. Um, it is a privilege. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett, for taking the time to participate and being willing to share your knowledge of the vast world of NASA with us. Um, I also want to recognize and thank our awesome schools for participating today, Vancouver iTech Prep and Camus Odyssey Middle School. I hope that you've got your best questions primed and you're ready to learn uh, a thing or two. I certainly am. Um, the other children in my home are, whether you can see them or not. Um, and now we're going to be talking a lot about 
uh, space and NASA. Uh, but we're also going to be discussing how important STEM education is for students and communities across Southwest Washington. Uh, STEM industries are rapidly growing in our re region. I often like to say, South, so we, we have a history of Douglas firs and, and forestry in Southwest Washington. But what I like to say now is that we have a growing silicon forest because of the growth in our tech industries. Um, in fact, nearly 40% of the gross regional project, product here in Southwest Washington is made up of STEM industries. And when most people think of NASA, they think of astronauts, which is an important part of the agency. Uh, but it also includes researchers and scientists and doctors and engineers, which are absolutely vital in running NASA's many programs. So there's room for everyone. Uh, NASA and its mission present just fascinating opportunities for students like those on this call uh, to engage in STEM careers. But also it includes research, or excuse me, but also um, its mission isn't just going to, it's not just going to Mars. Um, it's not just going to space, which is what captures our imagination, but it takes just a team, a village of all these different uh, industries and careers. Now its mission is not only to better understand the solar system and outer space, but Earth itself. And something else we're going to talk about and learn about today is which uh, Administrator Brian Stein already mentioned was the Artemis program, which essentially aims to land the first woman and the next moon on the moon by 2024. Now, I'm really looking forward to hearing what all goes into the Artemis program today, and I'm sure Dr. Barrett is going to expand on that even further. Um, and before we jump into questions and learning all about NASA, I want to formally introduce uh, Dr. Barrett. Now, Dr. Barrett's the real deal. He is an NASA astronaut, uh, and his hometown is right here in our neck of the woods, in Chemist. He graduated from Chemist High School in 1977, and then later attended college at the University of Washington, which is my alma mater, uh, in 1981. And then he went on to receive his MD from Northwestern University in 1985. So Dr. Barrett joined NASA in 1991 and has participated in two space flights that added up to more than 211 days in space. Uh, he's also participated in performing two spacewalks, and I'm not sure who's seen videos of spacewalks, but how amazing and a little bit terrifying um, does it look? Okay, you're going to have to stop. I'm introducing Dr. Barrett. Thank you. Boy, I just love um, learning at home <laughs> and working at the same time. I'm sure he's going to tell us about his spacewalks today. Also, during his time at NASA, Dr. Barrett studied the effects of spaceflight on humans and how we adapt to conditions in outer space, which I think some of our questions refer to. On a personal note, I've had the opportunity to meet Dr. Barrett in person in the past and have run into his parents during my work here in Southwest Washington a few times as well. So Dr. Barrett's experience and his history of rising to become a NASA astronaut is nothing short of inspiring, especially for those of us who are homegrown from right here in Southwest Washington. So I'm so thrilled that he's with us today. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Barrett. And with that, I want to say thank you to Administra Administrator Reidenstein and Dr. Barrett once more for being here, taking questions, um, taking time to hear from the students. Uh, with that, Dr. Barrett, I'm going to mute myself and I want you to take it away. All right. Uh, many thanks, Jamie. And uh, I also want to do a quick shout out to the, the uh, young men and women from Vancouver iTech Prep and Odyssey Middle School. I'm really psyched to talk to you guys today. And uh, as mentioned, um, as uh, Mr. Breidenstein said, there's a lot of things that are very exciting in space today. And when I was your age, I, I loved studying about space and a whole bunch of other things. And you know, I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up, but space was just really fascinating. Uh, but, but there's even more magnets now that kind of draw our attention out there and then whatever curiosity you have will never be totally fulfilled just as space is so big and there's so much to offer. Now I'm gonna start sharing my screen and uh, assuming technology serves the people and not the other way around, you should be seeing my title slide and uh, I'll depend on uh, one of our hosts to let me know if we got the title slide up there. Can see it fine. <laughs> All right, brilliant, thank you so much. So again, a shout out to you guys. And if there's any doubt as to where you are, uh, this is Canvas from Space. I actually took this picture from the International Space Station. It was uh, one of those perfect weather days when there were no clouds, no smoke, no haze. You can see Canvas and Troutdale there. And if I zero in, I can see my mom's house over there by Round Lake, you can see the high school. Uh, I just wanna remind you guys that you live in one of the best parts of the world. 
so never forget that it's, it's a great place to be. It's a great place to grow up. It's a great place to learn and a great place to go back to. And I never get tired of that. Um, I also want to remind people that the uh, the ISS program, the International Space Station program, is is very alive. And uh, less than two days ago, we launched a new crew to the International Space Station, including two of my good friends from Russia, the Sergeys, as we call them, and uh, one of my very personal friends, Kate Rubens, who's actually a microbiologist, not a pilot, not an engineer, but a world class microbiologist who's just uh, brilliant and a pleasure to work with. She's now back on the space station. And uh, this is who's up there now. So we have six people manning this, uh, crewing of this station, uh, and uh, they're just doing awesome work up there. And uh, it's uh, a dynamic laboratory, which I'll tell you a little bit more about. But I also wanna let you know that, you know, Washington State, it's not just, you know, the good Dr. Barrett from Camus, Washington. Uh, Washington really rocks in space. And uh, another one of my good friends, Ann McLean, uh, came from Spokane, and this uh, was me with her doing her last CBA practice run before she launched into space. She did brilliantly. She's one of our brightest uh, young rock stars uh, rising up in our ranks. Uh, this is what it was like after six hours of working with her. She's pretty strong. And so after six hours of working opposite Anne, you're, you're ready to get out of the water and go rest a bit. But it's really, really exciting to do. Uh, in our new astronaut class, which we took in about three years ago, uh, we had Kayla Barrett, who's from Richland, Washington. She's a nuclear uh, submarine engineer. She spent time on big submarines and just another really amazing uh, rising star for us. And in total, <clears throat> there's, a, there's another um, seven uh, that came from Washington. And this is across the board. This is the Apollo program, all through the shuttle program, ISS. Uh, and now we're, we're choosing people, of course, that will eventually fly in the Artemis, Artemis mission. So Washington has been a very key player uh, in space really much from the beginning. Now to go retro a bit, uh, this is me as a kid in Washington. So literally this is just up the hill from Round Lake. We could see Round Lake and Lacamas Lake. Uh, yes, everything was black and white. It was very boring back then. Just kidding, actually, this was, this was film camera and black and white was cheaper and this is what we did. Uh, this is all houses now, but it's interesting as uh, Congresswoman uh, Butler mentioned, you know, we've changed, we shifted from agriculture and, uh, and farming a lot more towards the tech industry. And it's really interesting to uh, have watched all that happen. Now, I did not go to this high school. This high school did not exist <laughs> when I was there. Uh, I, I went to the old uh, Garfield High School, but I am very happy to say that I go back to this high school periodically and, and talk to the kids. And it is amazing to me, the level of sophistication and curiosity and talent uh, back in the young kids in my hometown. So it, it makes me sleep well at night to know this is happening. Uh, and then after that, I, I went to the University of Washington for four years. Uh, this is in the springtime when the cherry blossoms were out, so a very strategic photo. Um, but uh, I did get my degree in marine zoology there, and I was kind of undergoing a bit of career anxiety. All I wanted to be was an astronomer before I went to college, then I shifted to marine biology. Uh, then I met this young lady who was going to medical school, so I married her and followed her. Uh, that is not a joke. Um, and I spent uh, four years at the Northwestern University Medical School, then another four years during internal medicine. And during that time, I was actually nurturing an interest in, in space medicine, of all things, and starting to gain contacts in the space medical world. Uh, and then I went and actually did training in aerospace medicine, a uh, joint program with Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and Wright State University in Ohio. Uh, and then in 1991, I came to the NASA Johnson Space Center. It's a beautiful place, and I've called this home pretty much ever since. It's an amazing place, uh, and uh, my first job there for nine years or so was to be a, a flight surgeon. So that was my passion, really, the human in space. How do we adapt? How do we prepare for space flight? What can we learn? How do we make ourselves as good as possible to be explorers? Uh, and these were some of my absolute best years, uh, made some of my closest friendships. Uh, Norm Thagard there on the left, the first U.S. person to fly long duration on a Russian space station. Um, in the middle there is Peggy Whitson, uh, who was a um, biochemist at the time. I was a flight surgeon at the time. Little did we know we would both go on to become astronauts. And uh, she is absolutely superwoman in space. Uh, and again, one of my closest friends. And uh, Dave Ward on the right was one of the more brilliant flight surgeons I ever knew. And um, from there, a very big surprise in the year 2000, went to the astronaut corps. So we had uh, 17 people who were kind of like me. And, and the first thing that made them like me is none of us had any idea how and why we got picked to be astronauts. Uh, and, and that's kind of a good thing. Everybody was, was just really smart, but very humble and, and just really easy to work with. 
This is one and probably the only serious picture you got of all of us together. Otherwise, you had 17 comedians who just really were pathologically interested in space flight. A few years go by and uh, lots of training. And uh, game day, my first launch uh, was on a Russian Soyuz. Uh, and the gentleman on the far left is actually Hungarian-American, also calls Washington home. This is Charles Simoni, who has a home in Bellevue, Washington. And he was actually flying as a paying participant. And it was his second flight. In the middle was uh, Gennady Padalka, a Russian uh, gentleman, one of the best space flyers in the business, and the recordsman for uh, duration in space. And I was extremely lucky to fly with these guys, uh, and they are my lifelong friends. And we flew on the Russian Soyuz, and uh, just a couple of numbers I like people to know. You can tell your parents this at the end of the day. First ask them and see if they know, but how fast do we have to go to get into orbit? Well, that's 17,500 miles an hour. That's pretty fast. Uh, and we do it all in about eight minutes and 45 seconds. So that's orbital velocity. So it only takes a little over eight and a half minutes to go from the ground into space, into low Earth orbit. Uh, I, I just, I'm shortening that, but it's a very exciting eight and a half minutes, uh, about a, a lot of shake, rattle, and roll, but, and you're watching your speed indicator go up. It's, it's really quite exciting, but uh, remember those numbers. And uh, then uh, my next launch was on the space shuttle. The uh, space shuttle Discovery it was actually the last flight of that bird, and it was just a real honor to fly on that mission. Same numbers, though, you know, a little over eight and a half minutes, you are going 17,500 miles an hour. So that's what it takes to stay in low Earth orbit. Uh, this is the current most popular destination in low Earth orbit, the International Space Station. Uh, it is big, it's absolutely gorgeous. Uh, and to give you a sense of scale, this is what it looks like uh, next to a football field. So it's, it's longer than a football field. And all the people are on the inside and the modules in the middle there. Uh, so it's still pretty big. I mean, everybody could potentially have their own two modules if they wanted them. Uh, and then you have to get used to zero gravity. And so everything is just gonna float around and fly around. And believe me, it does take a while to get used to that so that you're not losing stuff all the time or not running into things all the time. But actually after a certain amount of time, it's just absolutely magical to be up there. And mainly what we do on station is science. The reason we have this big, magnificent platform is to serve as a laboratory. And it tells us about the human in space, but it tells us things about medicine and physiology and physics, other parts of science that you just can't see when you're on the earth. When you remove gravity, you find things. And we have found so many things way beyond what we expected up there. And so the science output of the ISS has just been tremendous. Another thing I like to point out is that it's a bilingual station. So this is my friend Kate up there on her last mission, but she's holding an instruction book, which is actually in Russian. Uh, everybody has to speak English and Russian up there. So that foreign language skill is a really important thing. And I can tell you, if you learn one foreign language, you can learn another one, but starting with that first one is really important and it, it pays off for us quite a lot. I can also tell you that the older you get, the harder it is to learn a foreign language. You guys are young. I think you got the hint. Uh, any chance you can to either preserve another language that's in your house or learn another language, I would say take it because everything we do now is very international. Uh, and as mentioned, I was lucky enough to do two spacewalks. I actually did them both in the Russian space suits and uh, Gennady and I were lucky enough to take out the new generation Orlon suits and uh, that was just really exciting. And another thing I like to point out is that when we're up there and, and we're looking at the earth, there's no borders, there's no lines on the map. Uh, so you have to learn geography in another way, but it also gives you an idea of what the Earth has just been like for, for so many centuries, uh, thousands of years before people came along and made maps in the first place. Uh, and it's just a totally different perspective. And you can see the Earth in many different shapes and forms and seasons. You can see ocean on the left uh, and on the right. I've just put a picture of the Western African desert. It's impossibly beautiful. And I would just say that if there's anything that we could share, any one experience, that we could share with everybody. It would be the view of your home planet from space. And in particular at night, when you wanna see where people live, you look at the footprint of humanity outlined by its city lights, the city lights, and it just shows up against the background. And this is Cairo, uh, Egypt. And you can see the ribbon of lights below that blob, which is Cairo, and that's the Nile River. That's the lights along the Nile River where people live in the Mediterranean Sea uh, above it. So it's just incredibly beautiful. Uh, let's pretend six and a half months has gone by and it's time to land. You're used to zero gravity, not terrestrial gravity, not Earth gravity anymore. And you hit the ground pretty hard in the Soyuz. 
Um, you can see a little flashes of fire there. That soft landing engines of fire to, to soften the blow just a little bit. And I really mean just a little bit. But uh, otherwise, it's a brilliant uh, system and it gets you down and it's just really good to smell fresh air and to hear human voices besides your crew again. Uh, the shuttle landed a little bit differently, uh, kind of like a big cargo plane on a runway. Uh, so the shuttle was kind of a rough launch, but a very gentle landing. And so this was our, our shuttle mission landing. Now, that's kind of been my path and my experience. This shift's kind of what we're doing now. So uh, one of the most amazing differences between now and when I was your age is how much space is actually happening. So if you look at these uh, pictures here, the SpaceX Dragon and the Starliner on the top, those are being built and flown, either test flown or operationally flown right now. And the uh, Dream Chaser, the mini shuttle on the lower left there, <clears throat> we have on contract to start delivering cargo to the space station. So that's happening. Uh, Blue Origin, separate from NASA, is developing uh, also a crew carrier that will get to low Earth orbit. So the point being, there's never been a time when so many different human carrying spacecraft were being built by different enterprises, different purposes, um, different reasons, but a lot of commonality. Uh, and NASA is at the center of a lot of these projects. Uh, and the big change now is getting out of low Earth orbit. And that's what Artemis is all about. It's time to break orbit and go explore. As Mr. Bridenstine said, we've been in space for 20 years, continual on the ISS, which is great. Um, but we haven't been out of low Earth orbit since the very early 70s. It is far time to go do that. And that's what Artemis is going to let us do. Um, in the last century, we needed the Apollo program for many reasons. Uh, a lot of you may know there was a space race with the Russians, who are now our colleagues in space, which I think really rocks, actually. Um, but there were reasons to develop our technology quickly and show that we could get to the moon. It was an amazing program, but, but as I said, it was, it was limited. And the motion is outward. The movement of humanity is outward from our planet. We're going to stay here. Don't, don't worry about that. We're not evacuating. We're expanding. We're colonizing. And uh, that is the direction every country is going as the means to do that. Uh, our next step is going to be going back to the moon to stay, to sustain. Now, we're going to some very challenging places. And uh, this shows the South Pole and uh, the Schrodinger Impact Basin, which is a massive crater. There's craters all over the moon. Um, but these are the places that are extremely interesting because they have shaded regions that might have abundant water ice. Uh, and uh, they're also geologically very interesting, but they're also very challenging. They're not quite the straight and level ground that we landed on during the Apollo years. They're harder to get to and they're harder to navigate. And this puts us into kind of a more pure exploration mode. Uh, but again, we're doing it to build infrastructure and to stay, which is really cool. To do that, we need a big rocket. Uh, and so we're developing this space launch system, which will be a massive sort of back in the Apollo class boosters and eventually larger. We need to be able to throw large masses up towards the moon to get people and their equipment up there. This is the Orion capsule, quite a bit larger than the Apollo capsule that we use to send people to the moon. And we've already done a test flight of an uh, uh, uncrewed uh, capsule of this uh, uh, design quite a few years ago, but we'll be expecting another one this coming year with the full-up booster stack, and we're testing at a pretty rapid pace. It's extremely exciting to be building new spacecraft. Uh, and this is part U.S. and uh, the lower stage there is actually provided by the European Space Agency. So also international. And another one of our targets is to build another station far from low Earth orbit, but really in the vicinity of the moon. So that will give us a, a springboard to get to other parts of the moon that uh, were a lot harder to get to or impossible to get to with the Apollo architecture. So it's very exciting to be building another station, even a more remote one, a more remote outpost. And what I also find very exciting, a lot of my daily work is uh, uh, providing medical input to these new programs that are developing potential lunar landers. So we had a lunar lander in the Apollo system. We need one now. We need a bigger one, a much more capable one. And we're looking at three different designs right now. Uh, so I think, again, this is happening and it's really quite exciting. We'll have to choose one or two of these eventually, but uh, right now we're very busy doing this. And again, where we're going to explore is very challenging. Uh, some of these areas are gonna be permanently shaded. They're gonna be very cold. Uh, and geologically, the, the terrain is gonna be difficult. Steep, large boulders, craters, and uh, very, very interesting from an exploration standpoint. But as Mr. Bridenstine mentioned, this is also part of a bigger picture. This is a stepping stone, but it's a huge stepping stone. 
uh, on a path outward towards Mars. Now, when you think about the ISS, it's a big platform in orbit, which is great. Think about the moon. It's an even bigger platform in orbit. It's just a little higher than the ISS, but it is literally like a God-given space station that will help us move out in the solar system to explore. And that's what we want to do with the Artemis program, really get our beachhead there and establish our presence. So having said all that, uh, I want to talk a little bit and finish up with STEM. Now, when I was your age, I couldn't even spell STEM. There, there really wasn't a recognition of what it meant uh, to, to get versed and schooled in, in the science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Um, but we've learned otherwise. And um, the one thing I want to ask you guys is, is STEM only for scientists and engineers? So show of hands, is STEM only for scientists and engineers? Now, I can't see you, I'm using the force, so I can tell. So uh, don't think so. Um, one of my childhood heroes was Carl Sagan. And, and one of the things he said that I will always remember is that we live in a society exquisitely dependent on science and technology in which hardly anyone knows anything about science and technology. And that was 30 years ago. And I would say that that is more true now. We've become more dependent on science and technology. Uh, and there is a bit of a gap in the public awareness of that science and technology that really fuels us, our economy, our exploration, our whole lives. And so the answer is no, STEM is not just for scientists and engineers, it is for everybody. And the other question I have is, do you need to be a genius to work in the space program? My wife would tell you absolutely not uh, because she knows us all. But, uh, but here's what I would tell you is that, uh, you know, I, I'm no genius, I'm no Einstein whatsoever. Um, hard work is the key. Hard work is what gets you to NASA or to any of these fields that we're talking about. You can learn the STEM fields. Uh, it's not a gene that you have to have to, to express and, and learn math and science. It's not um, uh, just for wealthy people or just for really brainy people. It is something for everybody. Uh, all you got to do is work at it. And I certainly have to, and I still do, because we learn every day. Hard work is so much more important than genius any day. So don't let anyone ever tell you you're not smart enough to do this stuff or to be an astronaut or to work at NASA or to be an engineer or a medical doctor. You want it, you work hard for it, I guarantee you, you can do it, I'm living proof. And STEM education gives you those tools that, uh, that we know that you can use to realize many different dreams. Self-servingly, I hope that some of those dreams lead you to us because we really need a young generation of STEM qualified and STEM caring people to help us explore and to help us build. Uh, and again, this is our next generation after Artemis. We have a lot of work to do to get there. It's a very exciting ride, and we sure hope to get a few of you. So with that, uh, I will close and let the powers that be uh, take over. Well, thank you, Mike. I think we're just gonna do some questions now. And uh, I think uh, Congresswoman, if it's all right, I think uh, we'll let you go through some of the, you'll, you'll start and then we'll just go back and forth. How about that? That's perfect. That's perfect. All right. Well, so then we'll, let's get moving. Thank you for that, Dr. Barrett. That was awesome. Uh, I had to do some explaining as we went through it. My daughter keeps asking if there'll be a, a kid space program. So while you, you work hard and you get into the adult space program. So for all those kids out there who are asking the same question, this is this this is your opportunity to start uh, start on that path. A quick shout out to Naya to say hello at iTech. I just wanted to say hi. Okay, first question. Uh, and this is from Ms. Motzinger's sixth grade. And, oh, Ms. Motzinger, I pray I'm saying your last name right because <laughs> you're going to correct me. Uh, sixth graders at Odyssey Middle School. And this is actually both for you, Administrator, and for Dr. Barrett. Uh, in your career as a physician uh, on the ISS, which um, what abnormalities have you observed? in the human body while in outer space and then the second part i think is for your administrator or for either of you what is nasa doing to deal with these so sure well i could start with the abnormalities that uh, you know, the first big part of that question is uh, there's a lot of changes that are not necessarily abnormalities the body undergoes a global set of changes every system in the body changes when you go into zero gravity and you adopt a new space normal so what may be abnormal on the ground is now normal for space. That's your sense of balance, how your heart works, how your blood pressure is regulated, how your kidneys function. Uh, and uh, everything 
happens to make you a an extraterrestrial, basically a three dimensional creature that performs well in zero gravity. Uh, and uh, you pay for that a little bit when you come home because you have to readapt. But uh, we now know that there's a set of things we consider space normal uh, that are just they're adaptive. They're they're not harmful. They're maladaptive when you want to come home. Now, having said that, um, some of those can hurt you when you want to come home. So losing bone and muscle, cardiovascular fitness, and uh, radiation exposure. Uh, we've seen changes in the brain and the optic nerve. Uh, some of that research I've been extremely heavily involved in. Uh, and so those are things that we think are maybe not so helpful and adaptive necessarily. Uh, and so because of that, we have a very large research portfolio that's very focused on some of these strategic issues that um, that we've identified. I actually used to run that human research program for the agency. Uh, Mr. Brightenstein? Yeah, no, that's that's great, Mike. And um, so what are the things that we are doing to mitigate some of those challenges? Uh, a very important question. Uh, there are a number of countermeasures, and I know, Mike, when you were on the space station, you, you know, some of the things that happen, you lose one to three percent of your bone mass every month, your muscles atrophy, and so you get a, a pretty significant workout uh, regime going on the International Space Station to make sure that you're preserving as much as you can possibly preserve during your time up there. And then, uh, you know, one of the things that I think is important that we make investments in even today. Um, is is how do we how do we get to another planetary body? Because you know we know we know what happens to the human body on Earth. We know what happens to the human body in microgravity. In other words, almost zero gravity, just because of all the great work that we've done in, in low Earth orbit over the last twenty years. But what we don't know is if you go to the Moon, where the gravity well is one sixth that of the Earth. How does that counteract all of those challenges that we see in, in microgravity, for example? So, so Dr. Barrett talked about the fact that um, there's a lot of radiation in deep space, and of course that has an impact on the human physiology. But when you go to the surface of another world like the Moon or Mars, you basically cut the radiation dose in half because the radiation is now only coming from above, not from below. And when you go to another world, maybe you can get underground or maybe you can put the regolith the soil of the moon on top of you so all of that blocks the radiation from from you know harming the human physiology so these are some of the countermeasures that we think about but we still have to get from point a to point b and there's a lot of microgravity between point a and point b when you're going to mars for example it can be a seven month journey or a nine month journey to get to mars so one of the ways that we can offset some of the challenges from microgravity for the human physiology is to cut down the time it takes to get there. So instead of nine months, if we can make it four months by using more advanced propulsion systems like nuclear thermal propulsion or nuclear electric propulsion, that will be absolutely game-changing for our astronauts. Number one, they won't have to spend as much time in transit. They'll be able to spend more time on the surface of these other worlds. Um, and number two, it will also open up more worlds. We'll be able to go deeper into the solar system if we have, you know, the ability to go faster. So I think there's there's a lot of technological developments that that need to that we need to be investing in, um, but also understanding what are the countermeasures, not just in in the form of, you know, microgravity. When when you're in one sixth gravity of Earth, like on the Moon. How does that how does that reverse all of those effects from microgravity, or does it? Uh, maybe there's a another you know set of challenges that we don't yet understand that that could develop. So um, so there's a lot left to learn. Of course, um, these are things that we're very grateful for Dr. Barrett and all the great work that he does, and so many others um, to help us understand these challenges and then mitigate against them. Uh, there's a lot left to do. So I think it's a it's a it's a very important question that we're going to have to answer uh, a lot in the future. The next question, this is actually for Mike Barrett. Um, it's about you personally. How did your body? This comes from Gavin from Vancouver iTech Preparatory. Uh, Gavin asks, how did your body personally transition going from space? Uh, going to to space from Earth and then back from from space to Earth, from Earth to space and space to Earth. 
Okay, there and back again. So it's a great question, Gavin, and uh, everybody's experience is a little bit different. Um, one thing I would say is imagine a line between your belly button and the center of the earth, and uh, there's a gravitational force pulling you down, and you, that's kind of your point of reference. And, and uh, that force gives you your weight. It keeps you on the ground when you walk. It keeps fluid in place and all that. And now imagine just taking that away. So after that eight and a half minute rocket ride into orbit, all of a sudden that line vanishes. Uh, for all purposes, you're in zero gravity. And uh, I felt exactly what I expected to feel. By that time, I had already released the first edition of my textbook on space medicine, by the way. So I was curious as to whether it was going to feel like I thought. Uh, you get a, a quick fluid rush to the head. It feels like you're hanging upside down from the monkey bars. And everything that normally gives you your sense of balance is, is unloaded. And so your sense of balance is fooling you. Uh, and looking up or looking outside, if you want to uh, figure out which way is up and down, well, up and down is what you choose to make it. So all of those senses are, are radically changed and it's very provocative. Uh, and so a lot of people actually in the first couple of days get a, a version of sea sickness, which we call space motion sickness. Now, I did not, uh, but I definitely felt all of that stuff and it was really quite amazing. Um, and it, it takes a couple of days to get over the, the first uh, part of that. And then after a period of about a week and a half, your, your body fluids change and they decrease and you start to feel a little bit more comfortable. And uh, as your body redistributes and starts getting used to zero gravity, and then over a period of a few weeks, your sense of balance retunes to zero gravity. And again, you kind of become a three-dimensional creature. And after a few weeks, I felt great. I felt work effective. I could move things effortlessly. I could fly like Superman. Um, I could keep, well, keep up with my timeline and it was really great. Now, it, it's a little bit more exciting when you have to come home because now you have to readapt. And going from Earth to space, it's loaded to unloaded. So you're not gonna hurt yourself, but Coming home, you're going from unloaded to all of a sudden you're in gravity and you can fall uh, or something can fall on you and you can't walk very well because your sense of balance has to retune. Uh, and I felt all of that. In fact, coming back was a lot harder for me than, than going up, at least for the first uh, several hours. So uh, I think mine was pretty typical. We've had people who've had a much harder time and those who've had a much easier time. The more times you do it, the easier it gets. Uh, but we think about this a lot as we think about sending people to the moon or Mars because there'll be nobody there to help them when they land. Uh, they're gonna be rehabbing on their own. And so it's something we need to understand in exquisite detail and uh, be able to protect people from. It's a good question. Very good question. Uh, okay, this is from, again, from Ms. Monsinger, sixth grade, uh, sixth graders at Odyssey Middle School. Uh, and this, again, is for both Administrator Breitenstein and astronaut uh, Dr. Mike Bar uh, Barrett. What is it like working for NASA? How do you get a job at NASA, even as an astronaut? So I'll, I'll, I'll go first, if, it, if that's all right. Um, I will tell you, I... Um, I've never had a better job than working at NASA. I, I wake up every morning just uh, kind of in awe of the fact that I get to work at NASA. So we think about the best brand that the United States of America has, and I think it's NASA. What's fascinating is when I, as the NASA administrator, when I travel to Europe, um, I'm, I'm probably more popular in Europe than I am in the United States, just because all over the world, people have this kind of amazing sense of what NASA has been able to accomplish. And, and I'm, I, am, I am sure that Dr. Barrett has, has seen that as well. Um, it, I'll tell you um, some of the exciting things. Like this morning, I get up, I get a brief from our chief scientist and he tells me that we just discovered, I should say we didn't just discover it, but we really have more evidence now that the moon at one time had a magnetic field, what we call a magnetosphere, that protected it from the radiation of deep space in a similar way that the Earth currently has a magnetosphere that protected it, that currently protects it from the radiation of deep space. So all of those charged particles coming from the sun that can do damage to the human body, we are protected from, from those charged particles for the most part. But, but we, we always thought the moon didn't have that kind of protection. Well, now we're finding out that it did. And we also, be, be, and, and how do we know that? Well, we, we just opened brand new samples. These are samples of lunar regolith, lunar soil, 
that were collected from 1969 to 1972 uh, in six different locations on the surface of the moon. And we just opened those samples and then we applied today's technology from these preserved, very, very pristine samples from you know over you know 50 years ago. And all of a sudden we're able to apply today's technology to those preserved samples. And we're learning really for the first time how 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 the, you know how how did the earth and the moon interact in history we're learning that the moon had a magnetosphere and in fact you know just a few short weeks ago we discovered that the moon had rust well how do you have rust if you don't have oxygen and and how do you have rust if you don't have moisture and what we're finding is that through our magnetic fields of the past uh, oxygen was actually able to go from the earth to the moon and, and that oxygen is in fact still there today and we're we're looking now at the at the at what 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 are called cold traps on the moon the the um the craters on the moon to find out maybe there's there could be we don't know but there could be pure water ice in those craters maybe the ice is embedded in the regolith where it has to be separated and then and then uh, and then utilized after that but there's so much more to discover about the moon and we're learning more every day and it's just a really exciting place to live and work uh, and i'm thrilled to have this opportunity so dr barrett i'll i'll let you answer your way yeah i mean i love the thing about discovery because it's 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 something that really floats our boat at nasa's learning new things to the human side i you know when i came to nasa i, I all of a sudden was home it was like i met my peers who are a bunch of people who were just really curious uh, and really hardworking, and uh, really wanted to work together. And it has just gotten better uh, in all these years I've been at NASA. It is a community of men and women who are just passionate about exploration, about learning. Um, and I will tell you that uh, it's really internationalized since I've been here. We work with Russia, we work with Europe, we work with Japan, with Canada, but NASA is really at the center of all of this. We've built a human spaceflight community that is just unbelievable in what it's able to do, how it's able to function, and what we can accomplish. But NASA is really at the epicenter of that. Uh, it's a very comfortable place to work. A lot is expected of you down here, but but it's um, it's not because we're we're superhumans. It's because we're passionate and we work hard, uh, and there's a lot of creativity just flying and flourishing down here. So I mean, I, I absolutely love working here, and uh, I don't think that's ever going to change. So the invitation is open. All right, I guess I'm asking the next question here. Let's see. Um, oh, well, let's see. How, how do you get a job at NASA? That, that was one of the that was one of the questions. Uh, so uh, I, I think uh, it's important to know it's a when you work for the government and when you work for the government, you get a job the same way you would get any other government job. You have to apply. It's you usually do it through usajobs.gov. Um, but, uh, but, you know, every, every position at NASA, there's, we get a lot of applications. And so, um, what we really look for are people who, uh, who work really hard and because they work really hard, they have achievement and, uh, and people like Dr. Barrett are, are that, that kind of person. Dr. Barrett, how did you get a job at NASA? Well, I, I have to admit, I thought it was out of my reach for a while. Uh, I just thought people who work at NASA had to be geniuses and superhumans. And the closer I got, the more I kind of discovered what we've been talking about, that people who, who work hard and are just really passionate about it are really what NASA wants. And um, one thing that uh, I didn't have available to me like you guys do now is information on the web. Uh, and I would encourage you to visit sites like nasa.gov and just really explore those and find out what is happening. Because in, in space, <clears throat> what NASA does is very broad. Uh, there's biology, exobiology, physics, propellants, um, or propulsion, I should say, combustion research, there's all sorts of stuff. And the more you know about what we do, the more you might find something that sparks your interest so that you wanna learn that and really get good at it. I would say that you can't really get good at something that you don't love. Uh, and there's a lot of different things that NASA does. Pick something you love, get good at it, try to be the best you can at it, uh, and then keep close ties with what NASA is doing. Uh, eventually, you will make an application to NASA uh, for any of a number of jobs kind of through the same portal. But the more you know about us and what we're doing, the better. So log on, get engaged. 
So I have a question here from uh, Parker at Vancouver iTech Preparatory School. It's it's for Dr. Barrett. What is the training practice before you go to space? Wow, so that's a, a little question with a really big answer. Uh, there's a lot of training. And I showed you how much I went to school. And then when I came to NASA and uh, came to the astronaut office, I had to start training all over again. A lot of classroom instructions because you're learning about Earth science, space science, photography, imagery, the kind of science we do on station. And of course, the systems on the International Space Station, the shuttle, the Soyuz, the spacecraft you have to learn. You also learn some really cool things like robotics. Uh, we do aviation training, we do dive training so that we can practice spacewalks. All that is very, very exciting to do. Uh, it's very interesting too. So it's, it's not a drudgery at all. We also do something we call expeditionary training where we will take a small number of people, mostly astronauts, but we also have trainers and other specialists, and we'll go someplace uncomfortable to learn to be comfortable, to expand our envelopes. And that could be on a backpacking trip in the winter uh, in, in Alaska or Canada. Uh, that could be kayaking up the coast of British Columbia in the rain. We always look for the worst weather. Uh, it could be living on an underwater habitat, uh, or it could be living in a cave in Sardinia for a week or so with an international crew. So we do that to train people to learn to explore, to live in small, uncomfortable places and yet be comfortable, look out for one another and look out for the team. That's been some of my favorite training. Oh yeah, and a lot of Russian training as well. We have time for one more question before turning it over to the Congresswoman for closing remarks. All right, well then I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, pick from what we have. There's, um, I'm gonna make it, I'm going to make it two questions in one, and this is both from iTech and from Odyssey. What does space smell like and how much stuff is floating in space? And is that a problem that stuff is floating in space? <laughs> well, I could take the first one and then, uh, Jim, you can do the debris issue, right? <laughs> Great. So, um, and everybody has a bit of a different perception of what space smells like, but they're, they're, they're convergent. Um, in my mind, space smells like kind of burnt metal or burnt gunpowder. And the first time I ever smelled it was uh, when I was a flight surgeon, before I was an astronaut. One of my, uh, my crew, and I was a senior crew doc, uh, they, the crew landed and uh, the commander brought me a bag. And he said, all right, doc, here, you can smell what space smells like because we've kept this bag closed. Uh, so we got in a small room, he unzipped it, and I smelled this. It smelled like kind of gunpowder or spent welding rods. Uh, and then uh, once I actually got in space myself, we have a docking vehicle and um, you pressurize the little docking port and you open it up and all of a sudden you're smelling what, what would have been there in space. It's kind of that, it's kind of burnt metal to me. Not to somebody told me it smelled like well done beefsteak. So I don't know where they grew up, but uh, that would be my answer and I'm sticking to it. Now that, that's, that's inside of a capsule, right, doctor? Uh, yeah, just to clarify, <laughs> so uh, there's no air out there in space, so you can't smell anything. When we talk about <clears throat> the smell of space, it's the surface that was exposed to space, and all of a sudden you're smelling that. So what you're smelling is actually the interaction of the, the air that's carrying those, let's call them aromagens, to your nose. Uh, and so whatever is coming right off the surface of that space-exposed metal, that's what you're smelling. Nice. As far as the the the, the space debris, uh, Congresswoman, it is a big issue, um, and it's an issue that uh, that we are working to address every day. NASA creates uh, what are called space debris mitigation guidelines, and then we make sure that we share those guidelines with the Department of Defense, with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, with the Federal Aviation Administration. Every part of the federal government that deals with space gets those guidelines and they apply not just to NASA missions, they apply to DOD missions and they apply to commercial missions. Because a lot of what we do in space nowadays is commercial. When we think about direct TV and Dish Network and XM radio and a lot of those kind of capabilities. Um, so, so we're really good as a nation at creating those space debris mitigation guidelines and then following them. Where we sometimes have challenges is getting other nations of the world that agree to the same guidelines and then they don't practice those guidelines that they agree to. Um, now, I will be clear, the United States has made debris. Uh, other countries are making debris. We've got to get really good at dealing with it. So there's a couple of ways to deal with it. One, 
We have to get really good data and more data than ever before. So we have to improve and get more data of all of these objects that are in space. Right now we're tracking about 23,000 objects, um, but, but we can only track objects that are 10 centimeters or bigger. And there's anywhere from 10 to 100 times as many objects that are less than 10 centimeters or bigger. So that's pretty scary to think about. And, and you know, Dr. Barrett, uh, you know, mentioned earlier that to get into space, you got to travel at 17,500 miles per hour. So even if you have something the size of, you know, a penny and it's traveling that fast, it will do tremendous amounts of damage. So we've got to get better at tracking that data. We have to get better at ultimately doing space situational awareness so that we can predict where those those debris objects are going to be and then and then space traffic management and this is going to be a really big challenge in the future we know in air traffic if you if you need to turn left you need to turn right you have an air traffic controller the person says turn left heading 020 descend to 5000 feet and as a as a pilot you do it because if you don't you're going to have a collision well, we don't have any authority in space to compel somebody to maneuver the way we have authority uh, within the atmosphere to compel somebody to maneuver. And that's, of course, starting to become very, very, very dangerous. Uh, so we've got to make sure that we that we have space situational awareness, that we have space traffic management capabilities in the future. And then another big challenge is what we call space debris remediation not mitigation which is the prevention of the debris but remediation is taking the debris that's up there and bringing it back down so when a satellite comes to the end of its useful life we need to deorbit it if it's way out in deep space we need to send it further out into deep space just get it out of the way uh, so that it so that it doesn't uh, become an interference in the future so so it is a challenge i will tell you the president has given us uh, what's called Space Policy Directive 3 to deal with these activities. And of course, we're working with our members of Congress on both sides of the aisle to, to help address those issues. So, um, but it's gonna have to be, it's gonna have to be an international solution uh, because the United States, you know, doing it alone is not gonna work. We have to make sure everybody's following the same rules. So it's a, it's a big issue, but we're, we're up to it. Uh, we've, we've challenged big things before and we can do it today. That's good. Well, thank you. Thank you both. This is such a been such a pleasure for us. And um, we've learned a lot. Thank you, Dr. Barrett, for your wonderful uh, inspiration. Um, and to Vancouver iTech uh, Prep and to Camus Odyssey Middle School, I hope you got some of your questions answered. And I, honestly, I hope you have more questions as a result of this. I hope this inspired you to ask more questions. Um, if your teacher can't answer them and she wants more resources, you you guys, we can connect with you, connect with you. we can connect you with folks at, uh, at NASA. We'll get your questions answered and hopefully we'll stoke your, uh, your dreams and perhaps one day one of you will be giving a talk like this, hopefully not on video, hopefully in front of people, with people again, um, to future students and future generations. So, Thank you, uh, Administrator Brian Stein, for, for, for hosting and for, for bringing us together. Well, Representative Jamie Herrera Butler, thank you uh, for your leadership in the House and your commitment to support what NASA does day in and day out and, and, and your support for STEM and education and all the things that make NASA able to achieve what it does. Your leadership has been um, just, just, just amazing and impressive, and we are so grateful. Uh, for what you do for NASA. And of course, uh, Dr. Mike Butler, or I'm sorry, Dr. Mike Barrett, I should say. Hey, but, I'll, be a, I'll be a doctor, but nobody's going to want to see me. <laughs> yeah. what, uh, what an amazing inspiration you are. You know, someday when I grow up, I, I want to be like Dr. Mike Barrett. So um, uh, maybe one day I'll have that opportunity. So I just want to say thank you to everybody for participating, and uh, we'll look forward to doing, doing it again. Yeah, thank you guys very much. It's great to be with you today. Thank you, Dr. Barrett. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you all for joining. This concludes our event.